Someone I want to see. My friend, Sherlock Holmes. It's 221B Baker Street. Hello there. Welcome to my review of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, Episode 6, The Speckled Band. This is one of the first Sherlock Holmes stories I read, and is a hugely popular one. This episode manages to bring together all of the elements the previous episodes have been building towards, while adding a few new things in. It has murder, mystery and intrigue, as well as our first proper villain in Dr Grimsby Roylet. That's not really a spoiler, as he is shown to be pretty villainous from the first scene. We begin with a young boy being chased by a man who is stopped on a bridge by the wild-haired, wild-eyed Grimsby Roylet, played by Jeremy Kemp, who would also appear in the Sherlock Holmes pastiche The 7% Solution. The man is the local blacksmith who accuses the boy of stealing, and when he is threatened by Roylet, they fight and the blacksmith loses. This small fight scene is not staged particularly well, if I'm completely honest, and could have done with just a little bit more rehearsal, as it betrays how intimid intimidating Roylet is in the rest of the episode. We then meet Helen Stoner, Roylet's stepdaughter, who is with her fiancé, Percy. Roylet arrives and is polite to Percy, although seemingly begrudgingly. Roylet's house is in some disarray, and with Percy gone, Roylet is far less civil to Helen, clearly unhappy she's getting married. Damn it, woman! Are you part of the conspiracy against me too? The house is somewhat dilapidated, but Helen is not convinced when Roylet says he's found a structural fault in her room, so she will have to sleep in her sister's room, which she is reluctant to do. She does so, but is startled to hear faint whistling coming from nearby. Despite my criticism of the opening scene, this prologue really does set up some sinister goings-on, as Roylet tends to his exotic animals with a sort of permanent state of belligerence and bewilderment, as if anything could set off his anger, despite him being in a constant state of distraction. We get a few snippets of information not fully formed, which raise a lot of questions, and this really creates an eagerness to find out just a little more of what this is setting up. We then switch to Holmes waking Watson at an early hour, with Watson wondering what the emergency is, and Holmes replying it's a client, which clearly delights him. The client is of course Helen Stoner, who shivers with fear in front of the two men, and is reassured by Holmes, not Watson on this occasion highlighting the character development I've been banging the drum for. We are then treated to one of Holmes's deductive displays as Watson watches on. You have come by train, I see, this morning. You know me, then? No, but I observe the second half of a return ticket in the palm of your left glove. Normally, these displays show a client how superior his intellect is, but I think here it is to distract and calm Helen by getting her mind off her fear and showing how capable he is and will be at resolving the issue she has. This seems to alleviate her most immediate terror and there's a beautiful pause as Holmes leans in to look at her, almost as if he's checking to see if the fear has gone from her eyes. We then cut to Roylet reading her letters and discovering she has gone to see Sherlock. As this is our first proper villain, it's interesting to see him at work. Violating her privacy may not be a huge crime, but I don't think anyone would be happy to know someone is going through their personal possessions, and it adds to how unscrupulous the character is, demonstrating to us that his issues aren't just with rage, but that he has something more sinister planned. It's subtle, 
but adds to the uneasiness the character makes us feel. Back at Baker Street, Helen is telling Holmes her story, which is filled with tragedy. Her father died when she was a baby, and her mother married Roylet, only to be killed in a train accident, leaving Roylet an allowance to last as long as he cared for Helen and her sister. Something changed when Roylet gave up on his medical practice and returned to his ancestral home starting fights with all the locals and often appearing in court. Her older sister also died just a couple of years earlier, just before she was due to get married. My darling, what is the matter? Helen, have you ever heard anyone whistle in the dead of night? One night, Helen heard her scream and exclaim, the speckled band just before she died and as we know from what we've seen in the prologue history is repeating itself this all serves to ratchet up the mystery and the tension as it seems to be hinting at an almost supernatural element or at least it would if Roylet wasn't solely so clearly behind it all but just what is he up to and how is he doing it? Holmes is clearly troubled by her story, as Brett perfectly pitches his voice to hint at this concern, but quickly gets back to the facts, not just for his own insatiable need for details, but to keep the frightened Helen occupied. She explains she is now due to get married herself, as her sister was, and that she has heard the same whistling coming from her sister's room. So that last night I was forced to move into the chamber in which Julia died, to sleep in the very bed in which she slept. Holmes is thoroughly intrigued and concerned by these details, and deduces that Roylet is a violent man. Most of this scene plays out in close-up, which is an incredibly bold move as the actor has nowhere to hide but all three actors in this scene are so good that there's no hint of the actor behind the character. Helen leaves, and as Watson is about to tuck into his breakfast, Roylet himself bursts in and demands to know who Holmes is. Which one of you is Holmes? Do you have the advantage of me? I am Dr Grimsby Roylot of Stoke Moran. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard Jack in office. <laughs> this is a classic scene, almost lifted straight from the book and thrown onto the screen, as Roylet attempts to intimidate Holmes with a string of insults as Holmes returns the favour by being deeply condescending. Your conversation really is most entertaining. If you would close the door on your way out, as there is a decided draft. There's an absolute delight in watching Sherlock insult this brute of a man without actually insulting him. It's a brilliant demonstration of how fearless Holmes is for his own safety and how confident he is in his abilities. It doesn't, however, prevent him from being cautious, as he tells Watson to pack his revolver when they go to inspect the Roylet estate. Once there, they inspect the house with Helen, and Holmes formulates a theory and a plan. And we get to watch as he tests various potential theories before reaching the correct solution we just never get to find out exactly what it is. I don't think it would be possible to entirely guess exactly what's going on, but there are enough clues to be very suggestive of roughly what is happening. If you pay really close attention, you can probably get about 90% of the way there, and I think Sherlock is operating on roughly the same principle. I genuinely don't believe he has the full solution until closer to the end of the episode, but certainly enough of it to formulate a workable plan. Helen is to go to bed early, 
and when she hears Roylet retire, she is to open the shutters and put a light on to alert Holmes and Watson, who are watching from an abandoned cottage. In that cottage, Holmes explains how he detests doctors who turn to crime. When a doctor goes wrong, he is the first of criminals. He has nerve. He has knowledge. More than anything, a sentiment he shares with fellow genius detective Colombo, who often displays anger when a doctor is, a, is the murderer, while remaining relatively calm with other killers. This all adds to the tension as they both regard this case so seriously. Gone is the light-hearted chemistry that they share so readily in other scenes as Watson comes to realise the seriousness of the situation. This tension carries over to the next scene between Helen and Roylet as he taunts her with questions he knows the answer to. Where did you get to this morning? I decided to go to town too. I had some shopping to do for the wedding. Hmm. And based on how we've seen other cases unfold so far, it's never clear that Helen will definitely survive this encounter. Roylet may be full of anger, but he's also no fool, so he makes no move against her here as she retires to bed. What is his undoing is his arrogance, as even though he knows Sherlock Holmes is involved in this case, he still believes he can get away with murder for a second time. Possibly a third. It may be desperation that causes him to act, but from what we've seen, it's much more likely to be his self-belief that drives him on, believing that he won't be caught after he has murdered Helen, but not realising that Holmes is already there. Holmes and Watson get the signal and go to Helen's room, whilst she retires to her old room. Although, once inside, Holmes is still not completely confident he and Watson will be able to win the day. His hand trembles as he prepares, and there's a beautiful moment just after he has steadied it, where he looks around to check Watson didn't see him. The scene of the two men waiting for events to unfold is brilliantly filmed, with Watson in twilight and Holmes reflected in the mirror as it pans to Holmes half-lit before he strikes a match illuminating the rest of his face. It's incredibly well composed as the last quiet moment before all hell breaks loose. Holmes calls to Watson as he strikes at something unseen, only for a guttural cry to come from Roylet's room moments later, as the two men rush to see Roylet dead. Around his neck is the speckled band of a deadly venomous snake, which Holmes carefully wrangles. We get a brief epilogue where Holmes explains to Watson exactly how he put all the pieces together filling in all the small details that only Holmes could possibly notice. Fighting the snake back caused it to attack Roylet, while enraged. And Watson points out that Holmes was therefore indirectly responsible for his death. To which Holmes admits it won't weigh heavily on his conscience. This is a really interesting element of the character that we haven't really seen before. He has a very firm sense of justice, including life or death matters, and this could well extend to being judge, jury and executioner, as in this case. He could have killed the snake rather than drive it back, he could have just observed the snake from a safe distance, or he could have even captured it, as he demonstrated he was capable of doing and yet he basically chooses to allow Roylet to deal with the problem himself, not really caring whether he lived or died. It's not that he wanted Roylet to die, it's that he didn't care if he did, whether it be from Sherlock's hang actions or the hangman's noose. The final shot, 
shows Holmes content with his decision, while it appears not to rest so easy with Watson. He is clearly troubled by this darker side of Holmes. This is yet another triumph of an episode. It has all the elements of the very best of Sherlock Holmes on screen. The story is great to begin with. The performances are excellent from all concerned. The character of Roylet is perfectly vile, which contrasts with Helen, who is sheltered but decent and strong-willed. Holmes and Watson share some wonderful scenes together in both comedy and drama. The locations are spot on and the way it's shot is top notch with some beautiful cinematography and shot selection. I don't really think I can find a single fault with it. I wish it was worse so I had more things to say about it, but I really don't. Thank you. Goodbye.